I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and this week we are in the kitchen at Frida's Contemporary Mexican Cuisine with their co-owners, Alfonso Fernandez and Ivan Marquez. Gentlemen, thank you for inviting me into your kitchen. It's a pleasure. Okay, so Frida's, in addition to being named after an artist, let's first talk about what is the concept for the food here? Well, basically our uh, first idea was to um, introduce the Mexi the authentic Mexican cuisine. Authentic. Yeah, authentic. Right now, we have more than 3,000 dishes in Mexico, mm -hmm. and it's uh, probably the country who has more variety in food in the world. So Which, we don't know that in America. We, For the most part, we don't know that. Yeah, I know. Okay. I know that. <laughs> I know you know that. Okay, so you wanted to bring your culture here to Kansas City. And what have you captured here at the restaurant with your food? People was looking for it. People, uh, mm, the last 10, 15 years, uh, the, the way uh, Americans per perceive Mexican cuisine, mm -hmm. they know that it's not only Tex-Mex anymore. What are we going to find in, in this restaurant that we might not find other places? The idea uh, when opening this restaurant was to uh, bring a, a dining experience uh, more like what you would find in a city in, Mexico's, right. in Mexico. Uh, I'm from Mexico City, was born and raised there. He's, he was born in Mexico City, was raised in Guadalajara. Those are the two biggest cities in Mexico. Yes. And one thing that is uh, uh, what has uh, been, uh, you know, defining Mexican food in the States is that what you have been getting here, it's mainly regional cuisine. Okay. Because the people that have brought it, most uh, Mexicans that have come to the States, they come here to make a living, to work. Of they want to, uh, to get a better life. But they mostly come from smaller villages, smaller towns. So this is a more urban type cuisine, more sophisticated, if you will. More sophisticated in the sense yeah. that uh, what we were able to to do here is uh, because of our vision of uh, of, uh, of uh, how you eat in the cities. Is you, especially like Mexico City, where people from all over the country have come mm -hmm. to. They have brought everything. Into so Mexico is it City. a melting pot of the You can food? say that. It's very exciting to be exposed to that authenticity. And I didn't realize Mexico City then has become a gathering place for the many different cultures. It's like mm -hmm. how we eat in the Let south in America compared right. to Chicago, compared to the West Coast. And, and bringing all those flavors from America together is what it sounds like you've done in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yes. You have chosen to name the restaurant after a very famous female artist who is internationally known. Why have you connected to Frida Kahlo? Well, at the beginning was because a, it's one of the names that, uh, uh, as a female, it's, uh, we have uh, uh, represents us in all over the world right now. The new generations really recognize the name and they identify themselves a lot with Frida. And uh, we also admire her, uh, her life, her work. What was your journey, Alfonso, to this restaurant? Have you always been in the restaurant business? I got into the restaurant business <clears throat> when I was when I was 18 years old. Yeah. Yep. I started in a cafeteria. Mm -hmm. uh, girls would skip school to go to, to the cafeteria, oh, okay. so I loved working there. <laughs> yeah, you did. Okay. <laughs> Who doesn't? And, then, <laughs> yeah. and the restaurant we had was at that time uh, the place to be. So you were at this happening place there, and how long were you in Puerto Vallarta? I lived there 16 years. Oh, okay. And that's where we met. So you two met there, mm -hmm. and then how did you get from Puerto Vallarta to Kansas City? Well, two, two and a half years ago, I, uh, I was uh, going through a difficult time. I had just got divorced, mm -hmm. and uh, I was looking uh, somewhere else. And I didn't know exactly life, what, what was to be okay. until I got a message from Ivan. So you reconnected via Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, but 
you know, we talk about some of the negatives, but there are so many positives oh, yeah. with being able to yeah, be in touch with the, people. That would be the most important. So you know, why you did, you, why did you think of Alfonso? I mean, there could have been other people. Why Alfonso? Well, we know each other for a long time, and now I know that he that scales on the restaurant business. So what was your journey to Frida's? Uh, I was I started the restaurant business, but also I was doing my uh, uh, studies and communication. Uh, and we have the same degree. Exactly. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Mm -hmm. And I was working in um, a record company for I worked for Polygram Records for eight years, which took me to Europe uh, for. I was traveling uh, for four years all over the world. Uh -huh. I was tired to travel. So that much. is that is a lot. You're be, always on the move somewhere. Oh yeah. 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 It's, you don't have yeah. a personal life, you no. know. Then I came here to work for uh, Warner Brothers, Warner Communications yes. in LA, and that um, uh, gave me the chance to travel all over this country. And at the same time, I was looking for different kinds of cities to uh, different kinds of cities mm -hmm. to raise your family, you know, the right. kids and everything. Kansas City is a good one. It is. A, uh, it's wonderful. If it's not the best, it's one of the best. It is. It is. You know, we <laughs> just. One thing. You know, and we we've got all the arts and culture. Plus, it's just a wonderful, warm good city. Education. Yeah. I Great met my education. wife here, and. Um, that helps to get you settled. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it helps me a lot to settle down and know. Yep. You were in the restaurant business originally. You two met that way. You both exactly. understood your values, your skill sets, and then you went off into the record industry for yes. a while and ended up back here because it's a wonderful place to live and you happened to marry a Kansas City girl. Oh yes. They're a great girl. You know the little great women Kansas City song? Well, there you yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. I guess it's I guess totally crazy true. little women here. Okay. <laughs> it's totally true. Okay, so now you come back and you have both been true to your culture. You have brought to Kansas City authentic Mexican food that's really representative of several regions. We're going to make one of those dishes today. Oh, yeah. What are we making? Tell us. Uh, we're doing the chiles en hojada, which okay. is a, uh, I would put it this way, it's, I would say, our presentation card all over the world, the most traditional. Uh, very emblematic. Very emblematic. Uh, okay, okay. And I know that's a poblano pepper a stuff. stuff. Poblano pepper stuff. Yes. A walnut cream sauce, nothing we've created before on this show, and it has little pomegranates on top of that. We have okay, the it's... colors of the flag of Mexico yes. and the flavors that are so representative of it. Oh, yeah. Well, gentlemen, I think that we should go talk to your chef. Yes. You have an executive mm -hmm. chef, Diego. He's specialized and... in contemporary Mexican cuisine. Okay, I think we should talk to him, sure. and then I think we should go in the kitchen and make that signature dish. We continue our chat with the chef at Frida's with their executive chef, Diego Rios Torre. Torre. I thrilled the, thrilled the R. Is it sort of close? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank also you. for inviting us into your kitchen. All right, where did you get your training for this wonderful cuisine? <laughs> okay, I, I've been cooking for 20 years. You know how to almost. now, yes, okay. Kind of. Kind of. And um, I've been in Mexico for, for a long time. Yes. And uh, training about the pre-Hispanic cuisine, but it means the, how the old answers used to cook before uh -huh. the Spanish came into Mexico. So we're talking hundreds of years ago. The Mexican food prior to the Spanish coming to the country and that influence. So you learned that kind of cooking in Mexico and then? And then I went to London and I've been doing my degree in there for about culinary arts. And uh, I've been there for six years. Almost. So you studied in London for six years. We had a few of our other chefs study there. Where were you studying? Or were these internships? Or I've been on those six years. I've been working for fabulous chefs like uh, Jamie Oliver. We know Jamie Oliver. Yeah. That is From what a 15. fabulous experience there. An excellent. Experience. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay, so you worked with Jamie Oliver. Anyone else we might know? Um, Gordon Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay, we know Gordon Ramsay yeah. too. So <laughs> nice really some outstanding internationally known chefs. What 
What about them inspired you? Was there something in particular? Um, they inspired me, especially Jamie, when Jamie. His, the way he cooks is very fresh. Yes. All that Mediterranean uh, stuff. My mom is from Italy. So oh, you had a couple became, cultures yeah. that you, oh, good for you. Okay. So the, the influence from Jamie was very, very precise for me. And Gary Rhodes and Michael Rue as well. And uh, my last head chef when I've been working in London, he was one of my masters. And, and now, who, who, which was your master chef? Uh, Rolly Lee. All right, and what, so you learn precision, you learn fresh, local ingredients mm -hmm. is that and you m still mixed that or worked that with the fact that um you learned about mexican cooking prior to the spanish you've had a lot of different influences with your yeah. cooking tell me what is it you are wanting to what do you accomplish here at frida's what is it you're trying to make happen right here what i'm the I have like a project on my life, on my professional life, that to teach and to bring the properly authentic Mexican cuisine to America, to the United States of America. So that's a passion that of yours, that it should happen here, authentic Mexican food. So you're executive chef, you're providing leadership in the kitchen, are you, you're then teaching your cooks? I teach them and I cook as well. Every and you, so you're all cooking side by side. Yeah. So they are learning by observation as well as actually doing it. We are cooking today the chiles en nogada. Mm -hmm. Tell that's, me what that is, please. That's a stuffed poblano pepper. Yes. With a creamy walnut sauce mm. and fresh pomegranate. I've never had creamy walnut sauce before. <laughs> I know I will today. What are we going to stuff that poblano pepper with? We stuff it with uh, tender beef and uh, with some almonds, uh, apple, raisins, and the special sauce we make, the home, homemade sauce. And uh, and we're going to do it with uh, some poblano rice, mm -hmm. green rice, really nice and tasty. So we're having a combination of flat flavors that we are unaccustomed to but are very excited about. I think you and I should go into the kitchen, okay? okay? And I think you should come with us. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabikoff and we are in the kitchen at Frida's Contemporary Mexican Cuisine with their executive chef, Diego. We are going to make one of his signature dishes and actually a signature dish in Mexico, chilies and nogada. Did I say it right? Excellent. I said it right. Okay, <laughs> chef, what's what do we have to work with here? Okay, we have the main uh, ingredients that yes. we're gonna use. So this is the gorgeous. poblano peppers. Just gorgeous. Fresh poblano peppers. Yeah. That poblano means from Puebla, from the state. It's original day. That, that emblematic dish from Mexico. Okay, yeah. so we've got that. So we got that. What do we, we have, have here? a tender beef in there. Okay. We have a sugar. Yes. Apple, raisins, uh, sliced almonds, walnuts. This is for the stuff. Okay, that's for okay. the okay. meat those, portion. That's for the meat portion. Okay, and, and then? And it comes with that, with that sauce, it's a homemade sauce. A homemade we sauce. We make it in here. Okay. And this is for the creamy walnut sauce. For the creamy walnut this one sauce. On the top. Oh. That is the walnuts, the almonds, uh, cream cheese, and this is my garnish on the top. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful so pomegranate. Pepper. Okay, so beginning with the peppers, what are we going to so do? These guys are going to have a little roast, this. aren't we're they? We're going to roast these oh, okay. ones. Okay. So if you were at home, you want it on a fairly high heat, you watch you can it. You can do it on the oven. You can do it in Roast the oven it too. In the oven, yeah. Okay. Okay, time for the meat stuffing. Yeah. Okay, what so do we, we have, have here? Hot, the hot pot in there. We have a butter. butter. Okay. Yeah. So we put a little bit of that in there. All right. We put the, the we wonderful the, meat. The oh. We have some apples in there. Which adds a, a sweetness Just to nice, the oh. Nice and red apples. All right, and raisins. Some raisins. Okay, then to that some iron. Yes. 
Any sugar. So we're getting kind of sweet, crunchy, yeah. and the flavors of the meat, lots of flavor. And how That's long are we going to let that cook? We're going to leave it to cook like that for 10 minutes, 5 minutes. It's pretty fast. Okay. It's already dry, so it's pretty fast. There's so many ways to make a chili in a garden. So many ways. But so this is how it like happens at Breedon's. The chilies have roasted and now they're covered up in a bowl with some plastic wrap on top. We have the meat mixture with all those wonderful flavors cooking down on the cooktop. Now for the cream sauce, what do we do? Okay, we have the cream cheese, we have the walnuts, almonds. This one is for the garnish. That's the garnish, okay. And um, sugar and a with salt and pepper. So we put all this stuff in the, on the So you, you've the done blender. some cream cheese, yes. Do some, some walnuts. Fresh walnuts. I notice nuts are part of the meat mixture as well as the topping. Yeah. yeah. And almonds, let's put a little bit more. Okay. And some milk as well. Yes. So the milk sort of enriched, if you will, with exactly. the cream cheese. Okay. We add the sugar in there. Salt and, and salt and pepper. Yeah. Interesting that when you use sugar, you should also use salt because yeah. it helps brighten that flavor. Exactly. Ah, uh, we blend. All right, so the meat is browned with all the nuts and raisins and those fabulous flavors. How do you finish off the stuffing mixture? Okay, we're just gonna add this. So we make it here, huh? Okay, so this There's is a homemade tomato sauce. Tomato and jalapeno and some seasoning we make it. Okay. Yeah. So a house-made sauce that has tomato, jalapeno, and some other seasoning. It kind of brings it all together. We have been in the kitchen at Frida's with their executive chef, Diego, making their signature dish, chilies on Nogado. And now, because we eat with our eyes first, chef, we're going to plate this masterpiece. Where do we begin? Okay. So we have our plate. This is part of our garnish. Uh, it's a rice with, made it with poblano and cilantro. Oh, that, okay, so there's that's the green that's green. in the rice. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's going to be sort of scent. Yeah, exactly. oh, okay, that's then what? So then we have all the chilies we've been roasting on the grill. We roasted so them we and peeled them. Peel them They're and still take gorgeous. Okay. Right. So we're going to play it in here. Yes. Like that. You are very generous with your portions here. And again, wonderful meat and nuts and raisins with the house specialty sauce. Uh, yeah. Okay, the little, oh, I see how you do that. He turns over, nobody knows. And then we're gonna put on top the creamy oh, walnut sauce. Oh, heavens. And we're gonna start to give the color like the, the flag of Mexico. Right, and we, you know, we, so we, we're going to talk about that, but this is representative of the colors of the flag of Mexico. Absolutely. So we have green, white, and green, white. here's the white coming on. Never, never tasted this kind of sauce before. Really capture the authentic flavors of Mexico prior to any European influences. Yes, absolutely. All right, now for the red and then portion. For the red portion, we use the fresh pomegranate. Right. And I know that you, you've you gone far and wide to make sure you can bring fresh pomegranates Absolutely. to Kansas City. We appreciate your efforts. All right, there's the flag. Right, what else are we going to put? We just put a little bit with a chopped parsley in there. Okay. We just um, like to have some nice, ready. fresh green. All right, you know what, Chef? I think we need to go to the bar, pair this with something to drink, and then we have Consul Prado from the Mexican Consulate coming to taste your creation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us in your kitchen. Thank you so much. My pleasure. We have just been in the kitchen at Frida's with their executive chef Diego making his signature dish, chilies on Nogado. Complex flavors, a lot going on on this plate. What to drink with the dish? 
Ivan, what do you recommend? Well, uh, when you will be sitting with the consul, yes. uh, it's a tradition in, Me in Mexico that uh, you will have uh, before that, you will have tequila by itself. Oh, okay. You will sip it. No lime, no salt. Okay, I, I have to tell you, you know, we're used to thinking of tequila with all of that, but I see no. this is from the agave. The and blue agave, it's 100% blue agave. And uh, basically, you sip the tequila. Yes. You don't do the shot. No, don't tequila. do that. So we're going to have a drink of friendship, Council uh, uh, Prado, prior to the meal, and you're recommending that we do this. Yeah, I would recommend you to open with a silver tequila. Okay, so we can do that. All right, now once the dish arrives, what should we be drinking with the dish? Then I would suggest you to get like a mar uh, margarita. It's okay. a margarita martini. We call it Diego Martini. Okay. Uh, it's prepared also with a uh, uh, blue agave, but it's also have lime juice. Uh -huh. And it has a three types of liqueurs, ah. and it's uh, shaken and served chill. Yes. It's do uh, I see sugar or salt? It is sugar. sugar. And the, normally we put sugar on the on the rim, and yes. some of the ones we put salt. But this one in particular, we put sugar on the rim, okay. which makes the flavor, the combination of all the ingredients, mm -hmm. it goes perfectly well with the chili sangria. All right. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabikoff. We have been in the kitchen at Frida's preparing a signature dish. We went to the bar to get a drink to pair with it. And now to taste it, our celebrity taster is Consul Prado. He is with the Mexican Consulate here in Kansas City. Consul Prado, thank you very much for joining us. Now, I understand that we begin with the drink first for an authentic meal. Would you explain to us why? Of course. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me in your program. It is an honor to be with you. And yes, it is uh, customary in Mexico to drink a little tequila when we start uh, a, you know, a friendship. A friendship. Yes. Okay. Salud, Bonnie. Okay. So that is smoother than I thought it would be. Yeah, and let me tell you why. Okay. Um, tequila is a very sophisticated drink. It is a very misunderstood drink in the United States. Well, because I asked earlier, where's the lemon and the salt? And I was told it was nearly sacrilegious <laughs> that I asked that question. Tell me why. Yes, um, the, uh, the tequila is made from blue agave. Okay. And, uh, the blue agave is a cactus that mm -hmm. grows in certain regions of Mexico. This particular tequila is, uh, as you taste it, is soft and sweet. It is. Because it comes from the altos, the highlands of the state of Jalisco. But don't you, uh, we get sweeteners from agave too, uh, from that cactus. So it's capable of sweet. Yes. I know that Chef has chosen a very special dish for you that we've been making in the kitchen because it's from the town or the area where you grew up or where you were born. Let's talk about this dish and why is it so important? Well, uh, the dish that we are going to try uh, is called uh, chiles en nogada. Yes. Yes, it comes from Puebla, uh, the place where I was born. and. Uh, you may say that chiles and nogada are the certificate of birth of the uh, culinary uh, culture in Mexico. Let me talk about the chiles and nogada. It, they, they have a very interesting history. Um, Mexico started its um, war of independence, independence, similar to the American Revolution yes. in, 19, in 1810. Yes. And uh, it was signed finally by uh, Spain, recognized by Spain mm -hmm. uh, in 1821. Uh, okay. So a long struggle. Yes, a long, a struggle, long struggle, 11 years. Um, and then the, the person who actually signed the, the peace treaty between mm -hmm. the new creator uh, country of Mexico yes. and Spain yes. was Agustin de Iturbide. Agustin de Turbide created 
the flag or okay. the colors of the flag. Yes. And then, because that was the triumphant army, the triumphant general, the nuns of this convent decided to greet him with this special dish. So we have all the colors there, but this dish was created for victory to recognize our hero yes. on his way to Mexico City and also to represent the colors of the flag of Mexico. That is right. We are, we're about to have a very special dish, aren't we? Yes. And now to taste our signature dish. And they have asked that with the dish, we have a Diego Martini. So, do we, can we toast each other sure. again? Yes. Salud. And to life. Mm. Okay, oh my goodness. This is so good. It's so good because there's no mixes in this restaurant. Everything is made from scratch. All right, I've never had this dish before. Obviously, you grew up with it. Please begin and tell us, is it authentic? Thank you. Okay. Eat in good health. Bon So good. This is so good. Mm -hmm. Oh my word, is that good? It is. <laughs> it is good. Uh, let me tell you something. The, this is one of the most sophisticated uh, dishes in oh Mexico. My gosh. There are some people that put more than 50 ingredients in this that's kind of the, dishes. That's the other thing that they take such wonderful care with in in this restaurant and that is infusing multiple flavors. Mm -hmm. The flavors are so complex. And what Mexico has done with chili and chocolate is legendary. They belong together. I think it's one of the more authentic restaurants in, in Kansas City. And they are uh, doing you know, a great job uh, because they are representing a culinary culture, the Mexican cuisine that in 2010 was designated in intangible heritage of humanity. This was the first time that any uh, cuisine from any country was obtained that designation. Second one, France, same year. But really? Mexican okay. cuisine was the first one. And the reason is that- be proud of that. Yes, of course, are. of course. Mm. It, it includes, uh, mm. you know, uh, not only the flavor of the dishes, uh, the richness of mm -hmm. the and diversity of, of the cuisine, but also the way mm -hmm. it is uh, made. It, it, it comes from a culture of ancient origins. I should tell you as I've lost control and keep eating this, that each bite delivers a slightly different flavor than the previous mm -hmm. one. And now this, this margarita, it's just delicious. This it's, is yeah. the best I've ever tasted. I know you're very devoted to working with the Mexican and American um, cultures and countries there at the consulate. We thank you for all that you do there with your work and our relationship with we're neighbors. That's right. And so we, you know, we're very appreciative of that and also for being part of introducing authentic Mexican foods to Kansas City. We just, it's a passion, it's a devotion that you can feel here. I mean, when you walk in the door, it's like you're a member of the family and we're so glad to see you. And I think that's also part of the culture that is very endearing to us. And so we, we appreciate your contribution to that. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabikoff. We are back in the cellar with Marquis Selections and their managing director, Chris Cripp, in our lovely, lovely cellar at the American Restaurant. Hi, Bonnie. How are you today? <laughs> I'm doing well. All right, big questions. Ongoing discussion. Closures. Yes. Should they be cork, synthetic, screw on? How do we open and close them, and how do we store our wine? 
Uh, this is all about the care of it. The care of the wine, okay. and, and it starts really with what the winemaker is doing to care for it for you. Okay. So that's kind of the, the first, of how it gets into the bottle, or the box, for that matter. Okay. And so I thought we would just kind of go through what's been happening in the wine world, because in the last 10 years, it's really changed quite a bit. Uh, rather dramatically, and of course our goal with all of this is to preserve what that winemaker put into this bottle. Absolutely. Okay. They're all trying to be a shepherd to bring it from the vineyard into the winery, from the winery into the bottle, from the bottle to you. To so. me. All right, now, how have we closed these wines and what are the advantages and disadvantages to these different closures? Sure. What I've got for you today, um, I brought three different closures here, mm -hmm. and I've got a couple extras to, to show you to, okay. to kind of pop in as well. Um, but uh, the first is from Australia. This is our Marquis Organic Shiraz Cabernet blend. Yes. It is closed with the Stelvin screw cap. So okay. It's got the actual screw cap on the top of it, no cork, anything on the inside. Can I tell you something embarrassing? Yep. I tried to open the screw cap with a oh, wine, with the wine opener, opener. I wasn't paying attention. Well, you, <laughs> I gonna, won't do that anymore. <laughs> you're going to see it anymore. And look, the top of the bottle's black, you know. I know. It well, it fooled me, which so. didn't take much. Can we talk about the advantages and disadvantages to screw cap? Sure. Well, the screw cap um, is really a major invention from Australia, New Zealand, that part of the world. Ah, didn't um, know that. They yeah. are the earliest adopters of it um, through throughout what you're going to find. So if you're looking at those those ranges of wines, mm -hmm. especially New Zealand, and specifically they started with white wines and now they've moved to red wines. Okay. Okay. Um, but what it gives you is uh, on the inside of the bottle, um, it is sealed with a, a food grade polymer. So if you feel on the inside of that, it's just got just a little bit of a kind of a waxy feel to it. Yeah. Just a food grade polymer that makes a seal between that so that the so that the wine is never touching metal. It's actually touching the food grade polymer. And that I think has been one of the concerns is wine touching metal and now we know that doesn't right. happen so with the screw cap. So that's what that's really kind of what they've done with the screw cap. The other couple things that have really happened with the screw cap is one, uh, the first few when you stack them very high mm -hmm. would cause pressure and then you could break a seal. You break the seal just like you know you you cracked a Pepsi or Coke, you know, it doesn't retain that freshness. So it, it won't. Why did the screw cap happen? What unhappiness was occurring with the corks that led us to a screw cap? Well, that that goes right back to a little bug called TCA. TCA. Ty Tichloral anisole. Okay. Tichloral anisole is a um, it's a type of fungus that gets on um, gets on a cork okay. or gets into a batch of cork and it creates what we think of as cork taint. So you ever heard someone say a wine is corked? I have. That is because um, when they harvest, uh, when you harvest cork, cork comes from a tree mm -hmm. and they, they plunge out a piece of cork. Mm -hmm. And it, that batch is then dried and um, they, they cut it out in strips and they, they bring it down into to pieces. Mm -hmm. But when that's dried, it sometimes can pick up this, this bug. A winery can also pick up this bug. The precursor to the cork and bottle was a clay vessel. They figured out the clay vessel right. was not it wasn't uh, going to wasn't retain good. the flavors and the freshness. And so the the inertness of the bottle was was there, and then they used the cork, which they found from the trees, and they okay. felt like that was a pretty good I substitute. See. The winemaker said, "Look, you know, this is my baby. This is what I'm doing. So I want something that I can be a guaranteed that it doesn't have cork taint, and b know that it's going to hold up over time. So that's kind of why the the screw cap came about. I've actually been in a restaurant with a friend who is a wine connoisseur." Store, and we have had to return a bottle because it was corked. Well, the, the cork... And of course the restaurant was wonderful about it, but still, sure. <laughs> it the, happened. The, the cork numbers really are something where uh, up to, you know, 10 to 15 percent were... Significant. ...were a, having a taint that would cause a, a change in, in, the, in the taste. So some folks said, you know, I'm not confident enough to, about the cork, so... That's how the screw cap was born. Right. But also, so yes. So the, the second thing item I'd want to show you here, this is a synthetic cork. Okay, so do you open it the same way you do a regular open cork? this the same way. Okay, so, you know, let's see our synthetic cork. Take a look at our synthetic. We've got a couple different ones here. Feels kind of plastic. It does feel a little plasticky. Little? This one here is full plastic. You can see that this one's got a porousness to it. It does. This one is called a Noma cork. It's a okay. little bit different than this one, um, which is all the full plastic. 
what I find with these, the hardest thing is that they don't go back in the bottles very well. Oops. Um, but so you something they, you else. Know, this is a Mountain good example wheel. of one that will. Uh, the the advantage with the Noma cork, the other synthetic corks, is that you get the romance of opening the bottle, which is to do. Yeah, it's really a, a fun experience. You know, mm -hmm. there's something about it that you just don't. That I don't Screw you off the camp just in the yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I've talked to some great sommeliers across the country that, you know, have come up with a great way to grow the neck oh, over the table of and course slowly it's drama. Improve. Yeah, but it's theatrics, just, but it it's is not quite as not. beautiful as no. the, the ceremony of pulling okay. the cork out. Would you be good enough to show us um, how to the way to open a bottle of wine? Sure. This is our <laughs> Trapeo. Yes. This is the 2006 Monastro. Okay, so slowly you are take you first take a knife. Yes. And, okay. And so I'm cutting, this and so the there's two, two spots do. that you can cut. You can cut right. either below the rim or above the rim. Is there an advantage to doing one or the other? It really is kind of a personal preference. Okay. Um, it I do it uh, below the rim um, if it's a very tight rim at the top, mm -hmm. because what it does if it's very tight at the top, it, it in, interferes with pouring. Okay. Okay, so, and, here. and so now you've got a screw that goes mm -hmm. into, and what I try to do is I try to take the screw, mm -hmm. place it right in the middle. So the goal is begin that right in the middle of the core. And this is be it synthetic or be it real. Be We're it doing the same real, thing. Right in the middle mm -hmm. so that you should be able to spin it roughly five times to get the standard cork pull in. And then you've got a lip that you're going to want to cut the lip, mm -hmm. catch the lip there. Mm -hmm. And you just use it as a fulcrum I to see. slowly pull that cork right out of there. Okay. Towards the end, you we can... We don't want to leave cork in there. When you pull the cork out, yes. one of the things you also want to look for is if you... This has got a nice uh, color at the end of it. Yes. But if you see color running up the sides... Oh, uh, not a good thing. That is not a good thing. If you see the color running up the sides, usually that means that the wine has gotten hot. And so the wine has gotten kind of almost cooked in the bottle and moved up the sides of the vat. So okay, so the cork really tells several stories it, about it the wine. It, it can kind of help you. So when when I don't smell the cork, the Somalia gives me a cork. I never smell it. It doesn't it doesn't help you. Mm -hmm, I don't know mm -hmm. where that old wives' tale came from, mm -hmm. but uh, but I do look at it because I want to know whether there are any telltale signs of any. Uh, so that damage. means improper storage is what it means. Yes, it, means yes, it does. Storage. It wasn't stored at the right temperature, out of light. And so what did you just uncork? So that was the Trapeo. This is a Monastrel. Mm -hmm. um, so from the uh, Bodegas La Parisma mm -hmm. vineyards, mm -hmm. Monastrel is their uh, old vine grape. It's red wine. Mm -hmm. um, this comes from ungrafted vines. So uh, there was a big uh, phylloxera bug that wiped out vineyards back in um, in Europe uh, post-war, mm -hmm. and this was one of the vineyards that made it through. So it because did, it didn't ever no have grafting. that bug. So yep, no bug. What we find with it, a nice big nose. We've got a nice big glass to, to swirl it in and get some of that oak particles out of there. Uh, what I find for my Ooh. winemakers is they, you know. Depending Cannons. on what they're, trying, yeah, <laughs> yeah. what they're trying to do, this wine could go for a nice big steak. Mm, it sure could. But they, mm. they, they look at the closures, too, as in where their price points are. So, you know, this mm. is a $15, $15 price point. These are about 25 mm -hmm. So they went out and bought the reference one, the best corks that they could find for this wine. This is another style of cork. This is a... Um, called a twin cap cork. Mm -hmm. There are about three different types of corks that are made with real cork. This okay. one has a disc on each end I that is that. the high quality, and then in the middle is the low quality stuff. Okay. So that's the kind of the okay. lowest end one you can All get. Right. The the medium quality one, there's a another one that's made, again, with that food grade polymer that's on the mm -hmm. inside of mm -hmm. the seal here, mm -hmm. which um, it's, it allows the whole thing to be an agglomerated so mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. two or three different mm -hmm. types of corks. So the cork well, matters. Yeah, the yeah. cork matters as well as um, a growing trend in putting wine into a uh, bag and box. Which okay, is, and so people have kind of, you know, rolled their eyes at that. And what do you feel in terms of its ability 
to retain the integrity of the wine in the bag and the box? I, I think that for a young, fresh wine, okay. specifically um, you know, something that you know is going to be consumed within a couple weeks, uh, it, it does a great job about keeping the, okay. the oxygen off of it. I think it does a little better. The red wines stand up in it a little better. Oh, really? Okay. Um, you know, what I found is that in tests in Australia that, uh, that I follow have found is that the white wines degrade a little bit faster. Faster start okay. to oxidate a little bit more. So if you're going to buy a wine in a bag in a box, you might look for a, a red wine that's a little younger and have more confidence about that. Right. Okay. I, We've talked about how to open the wine. We've talked about the closures for the wine. Let's talk about closing the wine up and storing it so that we can enjoy this for a few days or so. Sure. Now there's a variety of ways to close. What do you recommend? Well, well I haven't finished the wine. What do I do? So first off, um, you know, we've got this, this wine, if you can look at how much, there's about um, four or five ounces of mm -hmm. air in the bottle. Mm -hmm. And so if you just cork it like this. With the cork that it came with. The cork that came came from, with, with. It, mm -hmm. will, um, it will be good for a number of days. Uh, if you go ahead and chill it down, it will last a few days longer. So just, if you don't have any tools, you don't have anything else, you can just go ahead and put your own regular cork in it, chill it down in a refrigerator, um, something like that, to mm -hmm. be able to, to let me go last for a couple more days. Do we want it to be on its side, or can it be upright once it's open? Upright once it's open, it's just too much of a mess to try it on its side. Yeah, because it could drip and do things. Yeah, okay, you, so you know, it's okay once it's open. Once it's open, keep it upright. Oh, good. You know, that's... But those bottom shelf spots are <laughs> in the refrigerator, yeah. you know, are made for. Okay, um, now, should we want this to last a little longer and maybe sure. there's more air in the bottle, so what do you recommend? Well, this is a, a little tool that I use. Um, mm -hmm. This is a, a vacuum pump mm -hmm. and it comes with um, a number of these small corks here. And okay. And all you need to do to be able to... Because air is the, one of the enemies of wine. Right, so this goes okay, that into any goes. bottle, so it's not it's not hard to put, press back in. And okay. Then this goes onto the top and you're pumping the air out. So it gets harder and harder to pull up, and when it's really difficult... Then you know you pumped all the, pumped air, out. All the air out. This, you know, at this point you can tell that there's a seal because when two, okay. you feel I a little bit of, okay. a, of an open there. But that will allow it to last um, slightly longer because all you've done is you've taken that oxygen out of there. Um, there's not a lot of surface area. If you have a big bottle, you open up a big bottle, you really want to try to do something like this, like a magnum or something, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if you don't consume it all because there's twice as much surface area sure. for it to be able to, to work. If you're moving the bottles around a lot, you know, that's, that also increases more surface area. It's just going to make it go, go dead faster. Okay, let's, let's talk about that because you said that movement, vibration, light, he, let's talk about the ideal way to store wine first before you open it and second, once you've opened it. So before you open it, what is the ideal setting for our bottle of wine? Well, I think here we, we have go. to start right, right here. behind us. We look at all of these bottles are first number one on their side. On their side. Are, are we wanting to keep the cork moist with the wine? Is that what we want? Yes. Okay. You know that it is less of an issue with your screw cap wines mm -hmm. or your synthetics, but specifically with any of the real natural cork products, you want to keep it on its side so that it keeps moist. Okay. Um, you're wanting to stay away from vibration. Um, anything mm -hmm. that's like by a closet door that would slam shut mm -hmm. or... Where um, children are playing and jumping around and... Yeah, okay. anything, that, anything that's going to give it that shake, all you're going to do, it, it just it um, causes quicker degrade, degradation of the wine. Okay, so, all right. So, um, on its side, away from movement. Light is the other one that we talked about. You know, the, mm -hmm. this is a glass that's tempered so that it, it's not pulling in any, mm -hmm. any regular light, but they want to be able to display it nicely. Well, so, of course. Um, but you find the same glass on uh, wine cooler refrigerators for your home mm -hmm. so that it allows the light in. You can see, but it's got, uh, it takes some of the UV out of it. Okay. Um, but if you walk by a place, 
see that bottle that's in the top of the window, mm -hmm. standing upright. It's been sitting there for six months. Don't drink that wine. <laughs> don't that don't wine. drink that wine. Okay, um, we, won't, you know, we won't do that. And then, okay, so that's the way to store. We've learned. Did I tell you the story of Malcolm Forbes? Mm -hmm. Malcolm Forbes bought we one of the most expensive bottles of wine in the world. Oh, dear. And he put it on display. Um, he put it on display in a glass case, oh, no. standing up. Yeah. And over the course of time, that bottle Cork just one day they were coming by taking videos of it. It's one of, supposed to be one of the specific Thomas Jefferson bottles. Oh my goodness. That's another story whether it really was or not. But but supposed to. Yes, yeah, okay. supposed to. Yeah. They found that it just fell right in the oh and <laughs> So much for the wine. Yeah, so Okay, well we won't do that. Thank you for inviting us into your cellar again and for taking all the care you take to bring us these award-winning wines. How can we learn more about your portfolio? Well, sure. Well, you can find our great stuff, like our new organic wine from, our, from Australia, mm -hmm. um, in uh, our website, www.marquee.com. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got um, our Facebook page, YouTube, Twitter, all linked in there. So we'd love to have you uh, follow us and see all the great deals we got going on. And visit us. Okay, I think when we come back to your cellar, we should talk about, I mean, Valentine's Day is coming up, pairing wine for occasions of love, and I think we should also talk about what glass our wine should go into. All right. So let's do that next time we're in the cellar. We've got some good ideas for you. Okay. Thanks, Bonnie. <laughs> to your health. Cheers. Cheers.